I've been doing the final assembly of the helicopter, and um, there's something that um, isn't specified uh, in the plans, and I just thought I would point this out because I had to ask quite a few questions to get a good answer to this. But when you're making a Stirling engine, um, you're often told to um, make the two pistons 90 degrees out of phase with one another. And that makes perfect sense, but what does that look like in, you know, in real life? So on the helicopter, um, if this, um, you know, if, you're, if your main um, piston is at 12 o'clock, here, um, you know, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, twelve o'clock. Then you want um, this one set at um, well, it's it's the position facing you this way. So if you were looking down on the helicopter, this would, that would be the six o'clock position. So, and that's assuming that you are going to turn your, uh, your propeller in a clockwise direction. If you're doing it counterclockwise, then everything is backwards from here. But let's not get crazy. So, if this is, a, if this is in a straight up position, you want this one pointing out at you. you know, not toward the back or the front, but here, which, again, looking down is six o'clock. That's your initial um, setup. Uh, what happens then after that is once you get the helicopter running, you may find that um, these need to be tweaked a couple of degrees one way or the other, and you, you'll just you'll just uh, you know see that and, and feel it, you know when. when, 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 when if the helicopter is running at you know, some speed uh, with it at exactly 90, you can stop it, um, tweak it so it's you know maybe 85 degrees or something, start it up again, and if it, if it performs better, well then that's a better place. If it's worse, then maybe you want to go in the opposite direction. So it's just a little tweaking. But anyway, I wanted to show you what the initial positions are, because on the plan, it looks like the initial position is this up top and this one all the way out to the back and that's clearly wrong. It just won't work that way. Anyway, thought you should know. This is the first uh, successful run of the, of the helicopter and I uh, just flipped the camera on it. I didn't want you to miss it. Um, I've been um, struggling with this for days now, fine-tuning and tweaking, um, you know, the assembly and, um, well, all I can say is it, it, it's not easy to get one of these things started, at least it wasn't for me, but um, after, um, like I said, about three days worth of tweaking and adjusting, um, and I'll, I'll go into detail on what I did later, but um, I just wanted to catch this on film. And we actually, it actually does work. I can see I'm running out of fuel here, so I'm going to have to uh, just burning wick. Actually, it runs for a while without the, you know, just with the residual heat. But for those of you who are hoping it will fly, it's uh, a, little, a little ways from that. <laughs> there we go. I'd like to get you caught up on what went into uh, finally getting the helicopter to work. Um, it wasn't nearly as easy as I thought it would be. Um, as I mentioned, there's quite a bit of adjusting that has to go on to make sure all the parts are lined up just right. 
because you need a very, very uh, frictionless or, or nearly frictionless setup. Uh, because, you know, as you probably know, a Stirling engine is, you know, just doesn't put out a whole lot of power. Um, very, you know, simple things like, um, you know, these um, bars that are in here that are holding the ball bearings and so forth. Um, you know, if they're just slightly, you know, out of, out of alignment, you know, you're adding stresses, um, you know, that are just going to, you know, build up friction, and the more places you have those, the, the less likely this thing is to run. Um, the other thing is the, the importance of, of ball bearings. Um, I mean, for example, on these, um, on these cranks here, originally when I built the helicopter. I didn't think I would need a ball bearing uh, in here. I don't know if you can see it, but um, you know, I mean, how much friction could there possibly be on you know this part running around on a, on a, on a disc here? But it turns out that there's a considerable amount. So I had to go back and remake these parts. I mean, the ball bearings are uh, tiny, 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 tiny. Um, but that made a big difference. The biggest problem that I had was I did not have enough uh, compression um, in, the, uh, in the work piston, or the compression piston as some people call it. What you need, I'm going to remove this connecting screw here. You should probably be able to see that there is enough compression now that it's actually moving this piston back and forth. Not a lot, but it is doing it, and you know that's that's happening just from uh, you know from air pressure. So. You know, uh, you know, when I originally put the thing together and you watched me build the graphite piston, there, there, you know, there just wasn't enough compression. And um, I've spent a lot of time in the past week or so um, exchanging emails with my friend Ed over in the Netherlands. Um, he's the one who, um, you know, provided the plans for this. And, um, you know, he explained, you know, quite a few things that I wish I had known sooner, but, um, you know, for one, the amount of compression here is, is crucial to making this work. And he even pointed out that um, when he built his, um, you know, he sort of ignored what the plan said. And after building the um, you know, the main cylinder block, he, instead of making the, the cylinder right in here, he made his cylinder out of stainless steel, um, polished the inside of it, you know, to make sure it was perfectly smooth, and then inserted that, you know, in here and glued it in. So his, you know, that allowed him to make the piston independent um, I'm sorry, the cylinder independent. Then for the piston, he made his out of bronze. And again, you know, polished, lapped it, um, so that the, the difference in diameter between the cylinder and the piston should be, you know, like a th one one thousandth of an inch. Um, and, you know, my graphite one was nothing like that. But, you know, since I was already committed to making mine out of graphite, what he suggests that I do is remake the thing, make it a very tight fit, and then, um, you know, before I parted it off, you know, when I still had some, um, you know, graphite left on here to hold on to, 
I was, he had me just, you know, twisting it inside the cylinder so that in effect, you know, we were getting the, the cylinder and the piston to, um, you know, wear one another. Actually, it was the graphite that was being worn, but, you know, until it was a very, very nice fit. Um, the other thing that he pointed out is that it's perfectly fine and helpful, actually, to put a little bit of WD-40 um, on the work piston. Um, so what I actually do is, you know, I've sprayed a little bit into a cup and then I have a, you know, a little um, paintbrush. And, you know, it doesn't take much, you know, just a little around here. Um, and, you know, in addition to the obvious that it, you know, provides uh, lubrication. It's also, um, you know, sealing, you know, any air gap that might be in there. So, um, you know, so that was something that, you know, took a while to, to figure out and get right. The other thing is the amount of heat, um, the, the more heat you can apply to this thing, the better it's going to run. Um, so I experimented with, um, you know, denatured alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, and then I recently got some uh, denatured ethanol. And they all work. Um, I tend to use the, um, the denatured ethanol, um, but. When I was experimenting, just you know, I, sometimes you get a little frustrated. Um, I knew that more heat would make things go better, so I have one of those you know little butane torches, and I, I tried that. And of course, that puts out an ungodly amount of heat. Well, this thing flies around like at about a billion RPM when you do that. But what I didn't realize is that butane is actually hot enough to melt Pyrex, <laughs> so it melted right through the cylinder. But but before it melted through, this thing was uh, practically reaching escape velocity. Um, the, um, this takes about two minutes to warm up, so we'll get that started. But, um, the other thing that I, uh, that I found, you know, as I was assembling it and putting everything together and making sure that you know, all the tolerances are right and so forth. I did have to modify some of the parts, and the modifications were tiny, you know, like remove a, a couple of thousands from, from something, uh, you know, just to get that perfect um, balance. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it does work now, and I hope it works now. <laughs> it's been working. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. But um, I was surprised at how much uh, tweaking and fiddling I had to go into getting this, getting this to work. And uh, you know, I'll know better for the next engine I make. And um, I certainly, the next engine, I will, um, you know, forego the graphite and use, um, you know, probably steel and, and bronze as my, um, you know, steel for the, for the cylinder and bronze for the piston. That should be good. Uh, that's what we're going for. Now, there are still some issues. Um, you know, one which is unfortunate, I don't know how to get around it, is that the, the WD-40, you know, can eventually find its way into the cylinder. And, you know, I don't know if you can see it on film, but um, it does...
you see that that little bit of you know, was less than a drop of the BB40, that may just made a huge difference in the, in the performance. But as I started to say, what happens unfortunately is that if any of that leaks into the cylinder, uh, you know the heat is going to you know, burn it, if you will, and uh, you know you get a little bit of charring on the uh, on the glass, and then you got to take it apart and clean it. Um, you know that's it's not ideal, uh, which is again why I would probably. Uh, do a better job of getting a tighter fit, a mechanical fit between the cylinder and piston in here, um, you know, so that I can avoid using the lever. The other thing you can probably see is the there's a bit of a wobble in the in the large pulley here. Um, I. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna end up remaking that fully. It, it must be just um, well, there's something slightly off with it. I don't think it's affecting the performance at all, but um, yeah, it's just a little annoying. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, you guys. You know, sat with me through all these videos and the building of this thing, and I, I just wanted to get you caught up on, um, you know, the final build and, and, and some of the uh, some of the things, you know, that hopefully you'll have the time or the knowledge now to look out for them. Um, When, you know, if and when you build your own model. Um, but needless to say, I'm very happy with it. Um, yeah, it certainly works. Uh, and it was a great learning experience. Um, you know, I could say, depending on my, <laughs> what I decide to do, I mean, I, I can always remake uh, you know, those parts that I was just talking about that I said I would do differently. Um, you know, and, and, and rebuild. Because the rest of it, you know, everything else is just fine. So, um, but I, I just haven't decided. Um, and it's not a bore. I mean, that's, you know, between me and the helicopter. So I hope you've enjoyed this project. Um, I really have. It's, um, Anytime you make something that actually works, you know, a lot of the pieces I make are, um, you know, sort of like art. You know, they just sit on a shelf and they look nice. But when you make something that actually moves and works, um, I don't know, I get a, a big kick out of that. Um, I will um, eventually. Um, you know, get this all cleaned up and then take some, you know, some nice photos with proper lighting and, uh, you know, I'll post those on my website. I don't know if I mentioned it, but I actually did. I, you know, I, I had said at one point that I was going to uh, uh, lacquer all of the pieces, um, and I actually did that. Um, you know, it'll be months before I know if it really prevents the uh, the tarnish that I was concerned about. But um, each piece was individually lacquered and then um, buffed. Uh, yeah, so hopefully that will do what it was supposed to do, and you know, um, yeah, so things don't don't tarnish. But anyway, I want to thank you all for um, 
hanging in there with me and watching all this and hopefully learning something. Um, you know, I've certainly learned from, from you guys with, uh, you know, some of your comments and, um, and I appreciate all that. So, um, that's me signing off and uh, thanks again.